Welcome to the Global Connection, a Tel Aviv University podcast. Journey with us as we discover how TAU's academic community and friends are engaging with and helping to shape this ever-changing world. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Global Connection. Today, I am speaking with Nitzan Weisberg, who is a lecturer and consultant with expertise in human-centered design and design thinking and innovation. Uh, she served as a consulting assistant professor at Stanford's Hasso Plattner Institute of Design before returning to Tel Aviv, where she runs her own consulting company in addition to teaching. Currently, uh, Nitzan is teaching a course at TAU called Thinking Critically About Technology Through the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Tract as part of the dual degree bachelor's program offered by TAU and Columbia University. Uh, welcome, Nitzan. Thank, Thank you for joining me. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's really great. Yeah. Um, well, I, I wanted to have you on because I feel like there's never a wrong time to be talking about technology and um and thinking about it critically, but with everything going on today when it comes to social media and AI, um, I think especially now is an important time. So um, I'm, I'm excited to hear from you um, about uh, your teaching and your background and, and your insight into the issue. Well, I couldn't agree more. It is a very important time to be thinking critically about technology. Yeah, well, and, and that maybe brings me to question number one, which may be the obvious question, but... For you, like I know for me, why I think it's important, but but for you, why why is it important that we, we think critically about technology? Well, I mean, on a very basic level, um, technology is just part of our lives. So if we don't have tools to think about these issues um, in an informed and a critical way, we're losing out on a big chunk of, of being human. Um, but sort of on a more um, uh, practical level, um, a lot of uh, a lot of the um, polarization, um, the political polarization um, that we're experiencing as a society um, is around technological issues. Sometimes we're not aware that it is a technological issue. But when we are not able to think critically, um, then it's very easy to manipulate opinions, and then we get the, then we get polarized. Then we get strong for and against. We get these extremes arguing um, without an ability to profoundly communicate and solve actual problems. Okay, okay. Um, I think you, in particular, have a really unique lens into this as someone who works on human-centered design. Uh, I think it would be helpful. I'm not sure if everyone knows exactly what that means. So maybe maybe you can walk us through a little bit um, what your expertise in this area means and and why why it's a helpful place to be thinking about these issues. Okay. So um, wow, I don't know how far back personally or historically to go, but human-centered design and design thinking as, as a sort of innovation or problem-solving methodology basically tries to put back people and their real needs um, sort of back into the equation. So um, fundamentally, uh, the belief is that um, we should be solving for the real needs of real people. So whatever technology, whatever strategy, whatever product or service we're developing, we should be, um, we should be making it for the, to serve the real needs of real people. And so design thinking as an innovation method includes um, talking to people, observing people, doing sort of ethnography, using tools from sociology, psychology, um, to better understand what it is that people need, what it is, how people make meaning, um, what's important, what motivates them, etc. And using that along with other um, tools like brainstorming, for example, to, to generate new solutions. Okay, so that's kind of broadly. Um, so I've been doing that for forever, like um, and and I've been doing that as a as a teacher, um, uh, teaching students uh, or working with teams work and consulting diff various organisations. So for me, it's always about the people. Okay. And um, and thinking 
critically about technology is a course that's sort of a spin-off out of that. Um, so in design thinking, we tend to spend quite a lot of time trying to even understand what the problem is that we're trying to solve. So sometimes people will want a particular product, but then we have to kind of say, wait a minute, is that really what we want? What What's the problem that we're trying to solve? So we spend a while understanding the problem. And in design thinking, we tend to do that at a very sort of um, at this level. OK, so we talk to people. There is another cultural level that can help illuminate why people have the attitudes that they have, why they're motivated in the way that they're motivated. And that's what thinking critically about technology aims to help understand. So ultimately, um, as a course, it's a practical course in thinking, kind of like design thinking is a practical course in developing all sorts of solutions. Okay. Okay, so you're very focused on human motivation, human psychology, um, but it, it sounds like in your in your professional career, um, in more of the private sector, uh, you're always sort of in this space where um, you're aware of this technology a little bit ahead of the general public, and and you're doing a lot of thinking about that technology before sort of widespread adoption as well. Um, so, so you're, yeah, you're in this sort of very interesting in between space that in between, um, a, a technology, um, being invented and a technology being adopted. So, I mean, it's not necessarily, it, it can actually include the invention and the adoption. Okay. Right. So it's it's um, I, I think actually that's kind of fundamental. Okay. Uh, part of my understanding is that it's a much fuzzier process than we tend to um, attribute to it. OK. OK. Um, so with that in mind, is the idea that the way that we as humans or the general public are taking up technology and using technology, it's not just like the technology comes and we interact with it and that's it, but our behavior around it can change. Absolutely. Okay. And it can change the technology. Okay. So. Okay. Very fascinating. Um, so a practical course then on thinking critically yes. about technology. Um, maybe maybe expand a little bit um, what, what that entails. So maybe I'll just talk a little bit about how the course is structured, not sure. in terms of the curriculum, but um, sure. we'll maybe delve into that a bit. Um, we progress historically, first of all. So we, I kind of say it's almost a random point, but um, we start mid um, 19th century and kind of move on to the present day, okay. just in terms of the types of things that we look at. And then we also... Um, go from um, looking at, well, I mean, initially we sort of ask, well, thinking critically about technology, what is it that we're thinking critically about? So what is technology? And one way to look at it is rather than give kind of, here's my dictionary definition, is to say, well, let's look at inventors. Okay, so let's look at what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we look at the individual inventor and kind of unpack that. Um, but then as, as we move through the course, we begin looking at, um, through a different lens, which is sort of a more social, cultural lens. So looking at it as a socially constructed process rather than a eureka moment of an individual. Okay. okay. So that's kind of another sort of progression through, through the course. And then I don't know if it's a progression or a tension, but we... We look from um, um, a kind of a technological determinism. So there's an error being ushered in or, um, or um, there's this, these ways of talking about technology as being this sort of inevitable thing to asking some questions about how inevitable it is, looking at various social movements who have either um, helped or hindered the diffusion of various technologies, trying to really understand them, not as a pros and cons, but as the ways that people make meaning and make technology. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. Um, so you begin 19th century, um, 
maybe I'll even begin there. So what, who is inventor number one that you look at? Oh, we don't, well, actually this is, um, we give some examples, but, um, but, uh, the students choose inventors. Okay, they do. Okay. Right, right. Okay. Okay. So part of the thinking critically, um, is first of all, going out there and sort of looking at, I don't know, Thomas Edison, Nicholas Tesla, whatever, whatever it is that right. is sort of, you say, inventor, boom, pops into your mind and kind of telling that story and then slowly beginning to unpack how those stories are told. Okay. okay? And beginning to sort of question because since we're very young, right, um, we, we really, um, we love these inventor stories. Mm -hmm. um, one of the themes that sort of accompanies the course is um, applying some some sort of symbolic or myth mythological thinking. So this this um, these stories that we love to hear about these individual inventors who bring this incredible technology to to mankind, right, for the betterment of of mankind. Sort of follows the template of of Prometheus, right? Um, the Greek uh, Titan, right. who right, who brought fire to to mankind, mm -hmm. and so we and 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 we love that story, mm -hmm. right? It mm -hmm. it hits us at a at an archetypal level, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we do need to ask if it's a true story, if it's an accurate story, and and whether it serves us well or whether there's a flip side to this um, way of understanding technology and treating some of these inventors as almost gods. Right, right. Um, so if you're beginning in the 19th century, sort of on the cusp of modernity, um, I can imagine, well, question number one, do students kind of, can they choose an inventor or case study from any period between the 19th century or, yeah. or now? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And they, so they do that from the beginning and the ideas are sort of building an, a social understanding around the creation of and diffusion of this technology. So initially we're really just trying to understand this biography okay. of the inventor. Okay. Right. So what's that right. about? Look at the way that it seems to repeat itself. Look at the way that even in visual representations, and it could be Thomas Edison, and it could be Marie Curie, it could be, um, who is not exactly an inventor, but, um, uh, or, um, or Benjamin Franklin, we see this template of, um, so visual representations, we'll see the figure of the inventor holding up a light, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sort of this Promethean archetype. And once you begin becoming aware of that, you can begin letting go of it, mm -hmm. seeing it for what it is, very valuable, very, very interesting, but a kind of a myth that our society loves. Mm -hmm. And it has a flip side. So if you look at somebody like Elizabeth Holmes, um, who who embodied that Promethean archetype. So Elizabeth Holmes is um, was uh, tried and and uh, right. Okay, so um, for um, she she had a company, um, uh, Tyrannus, and and uh, basically was valued at billions, and it turned out to be a scam. Right. 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 So right. Um, and so we look at. Um, at what happens when an inventor regrets what they do or when um, they embody this, this sort of godlike archetype and it ends up not being true. So we look at that as well. Okay. Um, so Elizabeth Holmes is very much a 21st century figure. Right. Um, and so you, you keep going back to Prometheus. And so do you feel like the initial story, uh, narrative around these inventors that really hasn't changed across time in terms of this mythic. That's sort right. Of, okay. That's so right. that's one element that sort of right. remains consistent in terms of the story we tell about technology. Um, but then when you, you get students starting to think about the social movements surrounding that, um, is that really a variable? Like, like a social, the social context in the 19th century versus 2020, I can imagine they're quite different or, or maybe there are similarities that, um, 
you know, in human nature, maybe we're not that different. So, so I'm, I'm curious, yeah, how you approach that. So I think, I think you can go back historically and find, um, and find social movements forming around various technologies. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, I think it's more, um, it's more readily available to understand more contemporary things. Um, but this has been going on for a while. So, um, and so that's another thing that the students get to choose and they do get to choose from various periods. But every time a new technology is introduced, whether it changes the way people do things or the way people um, understand what it means to be whatever. So, for example, in the um, 90s, there were a lot of... Um, a lot of protests from the deaf movement against cochlear implants. Okay. And so you're kind of like, well, it's, you know, this is a Promethean invention. It's, you know, people who can't hear will be able to hear. It's, it's what could possibly be wrong with that. But for a particular community, um, this invention meant, first of all, saying that um, they were handicapped and that there was something um, that needed to be fixed uh, about deaf culture, right? So they saw it as a cultural genocide. Um, and so you can agree or disagree. It doesn't really matter. What I think is hopefully a good outcome from the class is that you stop simply saying, oh, I agree with that, I disagree with that, and seeing that there's merit in this argument, even if I don't okay. personally identify with it. Well, and that's a really interesting point that you make in terms of the, the take up of a technology. Um, I'm not a technology expert, but like, say if you take something, there have been arguments made about the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, that you needed a certain cultural moment to be here in order for those ideas to, um, to get the traction that they've gotten. Um, so just with the cochlear implants example, um, like, are there moments where it, it almost feels like the technology and sort of the cultural norms of the time aren't fully matching up or it creates sort of a complicated situation? Or maybe as a design thinker, mm -hmm. your work is always, it's not about that mismatch, but how can we bridge the culture and the technology? Right. So from a design thinking perspective, working with clients, for example, they're trying to use those tools to to diffuse, well, first of all, to develop the kind of technology that culture is able to accept. So anticipate it, but just a little bit, not too far. Um, and then and then use those same tools to diffuse whatever technology it is, right? But it's not foolproof, obviously. And, and one of the things that we should know to anticipate in in public discourse in public policy is that it it seems to have a particular um, pattern right so the diffusion of technology has a particular pattern and we tend to see um, whenever there is um, uh, well you're always going to have people who object to a particular technology um, okay and and that needs to be taken into account. So if you want something hyper provocative and, and polemic, um, the COVID vaccine, right? The mRNA vaccine, that's a technology, okay? Mm -hmm. And so there was, I think, uh, amongst policymakers, I'm not getting into was it this or that. Right, I'm just, right, I'm talking right. really just from, a, from my sort of perspective, technology has tends to have a pattern of a diffusion. Any CEO, any, um, you know, person dealing with technology knows that you have your innovators, you have your early adopters, you have your early majority, you have your late majority, et cetera. And so there's generally, right, some sort of a bell curve and you're always going to have the, the laggards, the people who are, maybe will never adopt your technology. The attitude, though, was... Um, in many countries, we're going to make these vaccines accessible. Maybe we're going to give you various positive and negative incentives. And that adoption has to happen by, you know, right. such and such right. date. Yeah. Now, 
it didn't take into account that there's a reason we have diverse attitudes towards new things in society. And as a that bell curve makes sense um, from a from a sort of humanity perspective, right? So you have the people who are always trying new things and are more inclined to try new things. And that's great because, you know, we would have never learned all that we've learned about eating tomatoes and and you know flying airplanes without those people. But it's pretty good to have some more conservative um, people who are wary of new things. Because if something goes terribly wrong, then then those people have been lagging behind. Right. So, so just as the way that society organizes itself, that needs to be taken into account when you want to push a technology through very, very quickly. Okay. So thinking about technology and thinking about it critically then isn't only thinking about the potential outcomes of the technology. It's thinking about it's actual adoption. And, and the Absolutely. COVID vaccine is an amazing example. Um, I know there's been lots of conversation post vaccine rollout about um, where countries went wrong, too, in terms of that that gap of getting people to understand the importance of getting a vaccine and, and the best ways to go about it. And so. so so I'll just give you an example. And I think it was in Austria. Um at some point, there was um, there was lockdown uh, just for the people who were not vaccinated. It didn't last very long, but there was that was a policy for a moment during during COVID. Um, and if you looked at the percentage of the population who had been vaccinated, it followed the curve perfectly. So the the early majority was vaccinated, and this was now the late majority who had not been vaccinated yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, this follow. I mean, and this had all happened in a relatively short amount of time, so that bell curve was kind of squished into just a few months. But anybody who follows diffusion of technology, doesn't matter if it's in whatever century, understands that that is going to happen. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. And, and why? Um, why is that understood that that would happen? Be, because it, it, it's just the way it is. If you are successful in pushing a technology through and it is diffused through society, you're still going to have a moment where the early majority has adopted mm -hmm. and you're kind of dipping into the late majority, but it's not the majority of everyone, right? It's not everyone. And so if you have something like a policy that puts those people in lockdown, the, the late majority and the early, the sort of that area of the bell curve, those are the most normal people. Okay. Right. Those okay. are the normalest normal people in okay. the world. Okay. 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 So you need to understand that that is what you're doing. You're kind of taking a society you're taking the normalist people in society, the people who who being normal is most important to. Right, right. And you're separating them so out. There, there's always going to be a fringe of people who feel differently about a technology and a product. Um, so how much time should be spent thinking about um, the majority of society who may think in a particular manner um, and, and sort of the the fringe who thinks oppositely and, and in a different manner. Um, like what, yeah. What I, do we do with those people? What, what do we do? <laughs> exactly. I don't know. In democracies, um, those people's rights are protected, right? Mm -hmm. But but actually the point I was trying to make about the, the lockdown policy in Austria, which again, I think it was just for a short time, was that this was not the fringe. These were not the extremes. Mm. The extremes, we have a tendency to marginalize, sometimes criminalize, sometimes, and, and sometimes that is justified, right? But this was not the French. That's mm -hmm. the point. Well, and, and that's a really great point about, um, I think, the way that societal movements evolve is, I guess, sometimes we have these sort of ruptures that make us realize that um, there are forms of thinking that maybe we didn't recognize as much before in society. And so we have to sort of adjust um, to that. 
Um, I mean, not not to make this about COVID completely. Yeah, we but... should move on from COVID. <laughs> <laughs> but but for me, that was one of my biggest lessons: is you realize, oh, it's it's a cousin or it's a neighbor, and and oh, okay, they actually do think a little bit differently um, in terms of what you know what my values are, what um, other people's values are. So, but moving on from COVID, I agree. Hang on, I want to pick up on that. Sorry, okay, we're going okay, to linger. Go it's it. not really just about COVID, I think. The issue is that people's attitudes and opinions are not necessarily so fixed. It's not like we're born with this identity and a set of values, etc. And the whole point of looking at diffusion of technology, and this is just one part of thinking critically about technology, but is that diffusion of technology is is it's a societal process it's where people initially look at just a small bunch of people so mm -hmm. a, a relatively small group of people looks at a really tiny group of people and they're like well that's kind of interesting and then a larger group of people looks at this other small group of people and they have to to be people that they admire OK, so they look at people who they admire, who are a bit far off and a bit extreme, but they kind of admire them. And they're like, I, I, I like that. I, I want to be a little bit more like that. And so that's how the early majority okay. grows. Right. And then the late majority is just slower at adopting. They're a they need more convincing. That's okay. what they are. Okay. They need to see more people like their neighbours, not just one neighbour on the street. They need to see five neighbours on their street doing something in order to be convinced, right? That's just how we find um, different sort of temperaments dispersed in a society. Okay, okay. Um, when you say the societal inclination then, and it, it sounds like um, probably the answer is yes, but maybe it's so, um, is to um, warmly adopt a new technology, um, or, or maybe that's not fixed. Um, so I'm, I'm even thinking about the Elizabeth Holmes example. Like if the story is good enough, yeah. the reaction is, yes, we want to support this yes. and, and we're going to believe it and we want to believe yes. it. Um, so how often is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? How often can it be dangerous? Um, how do we even sort of reconcile and, and think about um, human norms and behavior in relationship or in relation to technology um, and and the question of when technology can be sort of not helpful or potentially even dangerous as well. Right. Um, so so this is where design thinking actually helps think about this. It's not one answer. Okay. It depends for who. Right. So some technologies are amazing for some people and a terrible tragedy for others. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on how they understand it. It depends on how their society is structured. So so there's no one answer and not just because I don't want to give an answer. It We have tools to begin exploring that and we should begin exploring that. So whether it's a vaccine rollout or whether it's something else, it's important to understand the way different groups make meaning um, if we want to help diffusion. Um, it's also interesting and important, I think, to listen to social movements because they seem to be very vocal. They vocalize, they're extreme, mm -hmm. but they vocalize some of the sort of um, uh, more tacit kind of or, or less explicit feelings or, or suspicions, etc. cetera. So, um, for example, when, um, when electricity was being diffused in society. And it, part of that was done in the pro by the private sector. And at some point it became um, a, a, a new deal, right? It became a, a public policy, certainly in America and other countries. Today it's, it's considered a human right, right? But it wasn't, right? Mm -hmm. That was a process that happened. Mm -hmm. But during that, you had lots and lots of scares. So initially people would see... Um, electrical wires out in the street. It took time for electricity to enter the home and enter the home of ordinary people. So it was just ugly. You know, their blue skies were 
were covered in um, cobwebs of wires, right? Okay. So that was one outrage, right? And then um, later on, I'm talking like a, a few decades afterwards, people would get electricity installed and they would be um, stuffing um, stuffing rags into into the socket because their understanding of what electricity was was that it was some sort of a liquid and it would flow out if you didn't. Right. Right? Okay. There was okay. A, a childhood leukemia scare. People, again, as more electricity was sort of built into houses, people were very afraid that this was causing childhood leukemia because of something that was happening in the walls. So... Um, I don't know why I told you that, but anyway. Right, yeah. Um, so I, one, of, one of the areas of consideration is the fear of the unknown. Yes. Okay. And from a design perspective, then, how do you, um, it must be important with new technologies, like, like you mentioned, having cobwebs of wires everywhere probably will scare people a little bit more yeah. than when you have one clean wire going from house to house. Um, so... How much of the design of a technology impacts the way people, like the physical design, impacts the way? People oh, I think I it? think there's been an understanding that physical design is definitely one of the things that can help adoption, and there have been whole um, policies shaped around that. It's in, it's been such a generative conversation. I still have. So many more questions. Um, I invite other people to hopefully they have questions too, and they. You know, they'll follow them through and start doing a bit more research and thinking on technology. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much. 